This episode is brought to you by Steelroot, a national leader in helping companies meet cybersecurity compliance requirements and prepare for CMMC. Their experienced team of engineers and consultants assist organizations of all sizes to implement and manage IT systems that meet the technical requirements in DFARS and CMMC. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of 123 CMMC. My name is Dana Mantilia and I will be your host today. And for our guest, we have for a second time return, Ryan Heidorn from Steelroot. Hello, Ryan, how are you? I'm doing well. I feel like you need to say whose two day winnings total $80,000. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. <laughs> Glad to, glad to have you back. So today we're going to talk about something that some people may not know what it is, and your expertise is going to educate all of us. So we're going to talk about zero trust. So let's see here. Our first question is, what is zero trust and why has it risen to prominence? Yes. So we have to be pretty careful because zero trust is getting thrown around as a buzzword or hype phrase, which really is unfortunate because it's actually a extremely valuable cybersecurity concept. So the reason for that is we don't really have a common vocabulary for talking about zero trust, and it can mean different things to different people. But I would say that zero trust is a security philosophy or even a framework or a set of cybersecurity design principles. And basically, it comes down to this. So in contrast to that old saying, trust but verify, mm -hmm. a core concept of the zero trust model is to never trust and always verify. So the guy who came up with the idea of zero trust uh, says that trust is a vulnerability that can be exploited. And I think that's a, a good way to think of it. So let's just say that you've got a server that's hosting a sensitive application, right? Maybe it's your internal ERP system. And you don't just leave this thing open to the internet because it's not 2005 anymore, right? You've got a VPN in front of it, hopefully. But the problem here is that we're assuming that that VPN is trustworthy. So what's going to happen when someone's got an old VPN account hanging out there and the password gets stolen, like what happened with the Colonial Pipeline attack? Suddenly, that VPN doesn't seem so trustworthy anymore, and that's where zero trust comes in. So zero trust has become this dominant cybersecurity philosophy right now, because especially in the post-COVID world, it addresses the reality that data has moved to the cloud and that users are accessing company data from anywhere, whether that's the office or home or Starbucks or wherever. So zero trust is moving security defenses away from the old network centric perimeters. So instead of firewalls, VPNs, intrusion detection systems, we're now focusing on user identities, devices and individual resources. And instead of granting access to company resources when you're on the company network, Zero Trust says to verify every access request every single time. And maybe the last thing I'll say by way of introduction is that Zero Trust is also using as much contextual data as possible to make decisions around whether you should have access to something or not. So it's like, OK, you've got the right username and password, but why is secure boot disabled on your laptop? Something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Zero trust also means segmenting your sensitive resources as much as possible so that when an attacker fishes a password or hacks into a, a single server, they don't now automatically have keys to the entire kingdom. That's very good. And I also think too, there's gotta be, you know, there's a little bit of emotion that gets involved with or judgment that gets involved with trusting, you know, or mm -hmm. just assuming. I think that sometimes happens too, is that the trust is assumed that this is going on. So I think that this is, it's a good strategy for everybody to understand. And thank you very much for that uh, explanation. That was a really good start to this. So what would a zero trust strategy look like for CMMC? Right, so another core tenant of zero trust, one that I really like and think is appropriate for CMMC specifically is to assume breach. So assume that an attacker has already breached your network, and they're going to do it again. And that mindset is pretty spot on when you look at what's happened in the defense industrial base, basically our adversaries robbing us blind of intellectual property. So if you start with that assume breach mindset, it does away with some of the magical thinking around trust, like you're mentioning. So I think a zero trust strategy actually makes a ton of sense for 
probably most companies in the defense industrial base. Um, as we know, for years, defense contractors have been saying that they're DFARS compliant, but we also know that many haven't been investing in cybersecurity and IT nearly enough over the years. So these companies really need a fast, dramatic change in their cybersecurity capabilities if they're going to meet CMMC, especially at level three. Um, so I think that zero trust is interesting for the DIB because it could potentially bypass what we call technical debt. And that basically means, you know, you've got this poorly designed network, maybe that you haven't invested in as much as you should. And no one's logged into the firewall since 2018 when the camera guy was here. Um, but we don't care about that as much anymore because we don't trust the network in a zero trust architecture. But the thing with CMMC in particular is that some of the underlying requirements were written assuming that you do have a traditional network-centric security perimeter. So there's talk in the requirements around protecting remote access, for example. And the question is, well, what exactly is remote access when everything is in the cloud, right? So there's some semantics that need to be negotiated there. But you know, in my opinion, the entire federal government is headed towards zero trust. And I've really got no doubt that if you're using zero trust principles to meet CMMC practices, then you're probably meeting or exceeding the requirements. You know, and the other thing is if we could ever get people to think assume breach just in their head with, with, with thinking about anything that they do with their computer, with anything related to uh, the internet or anything, that would be great. So whoever finds that magic way of getting everybody to automatically be thinking right out of the gate, I'm going to assume a breach, assume a breach with everything that they do, we would be in a whole different situation. So maybe there's a way we can turn this into a, a mental thing too, as opposed to just a, you know, techno technological thing. All Definitely. right. So uh, let's see. Steelroot, a national leader in helping companies in the defense industrial base with CMMC preparation and federal cybersecurity regulations. Big or small, Steelroot is here to help design, build, and manage IT. The Steelroot reference architecture is a secure, cloud native operating environment built on zero trust principles. Steelroot also provides managed cybersecurity, IT, and virtual ISSO services. Visit steelroot.us for more information. Here, So this one here. So why is this becoming such a prominent thing? I think you kind of touched on this a little bit, and then I jumped over to CMMC. But why do you think this is happening? Well, like I said, I think a big part of it is COVID-driven. Um, the idea of zero trust isn't new. The concepts have been around for over a decade. But with COVID, when we saw the shift to um, work from home, I think that really kind of jostled everyone into understanding, oh, we really are in this world where I can't just put somebody in a my secure network and, and rely on that for protection. I have to take an, another approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. So let's see here. Does zero trust really mean zero? Did we just go over this one? Uh, we didn't, but that's a good one. Yeah. So you know, that's a fun question for me because I think you'll find some people who are super passionate who are going to say that everything we're doing today with regard to zero trust is a sham because we are not eliminating trust. We're just reducing it. We never really get to zero. Um, my opinion, I think this is okay. So for me, zero trust is about shrinking those trust boundaries and bringing in the contextual information like we were mentioning to make these decisions around whether you're going to grant access or not grant access. Um, it's about defense in depth or having multiple layers of security in that assume breach mindset, that kind of thing. So NIST actually put out recently a draft white paper, and it said in an ideal zero trust architecture, every unique operation would undergo authentication and authorization before it's performed. But that's not always possible. So, you know, hopefully it's possible in the future to get to true zero trust. But I also wonder, um, back to that, that phrase, trust is a vulnerability that can be exploited. Is it a reasonable expectation to get to zero vulnerabilities? I'm not sure, or maybe is it more about risk management? But either way, I think there are huge benefits to implementing zero trust principles today. Well, even just starting to, to implement them with some some things. So this is a mm. good segue to the next question. So how can a company get started with zero trust? Is it just something that they throw onto their computer or does it have to be downloaded onto everything or how does this work? 
Well, it's definitely not a single product or solution. So you're not going to go buy Zero Trust from Best Buy, right? Um, and any vendor that's selling you Zero Trust, you know, maybe be a little uh, suspicious of their claims. But, you know, I think a good way to get started is just to familiarize yourself with the terms, because remember, this is a security philosophy and a set of principles more than a prescriptive solution. And for that, I would point to NIST SP 800-207, Zero Trust Architecture. It talks at a high level about the major components. And really what you'll hear people say is that if you want to get started, it comes down to ICAM or Identity Credential and Access Management, because so much of Zero Trust revolves around a user's identity. And you really do need a strong centralized identity store that supports using these other data sources and data streams and telemetry to make access control decisions. And these capabilities, they're already out there today. So um, if you don't already have strong centralized identity, that's where you start. And you know, it's probably different if you're a small company or a large company. If I'm a large company, I'm thinking, how many of these identity stores do I have out there today? Are they global? Um, what other sources of information integrate here so that I can make policy decisions? Whereas if I'm a smaller organization with you know, maybe old IT infrastructure, I might be looking to completely migrate to a modern architecture as one big initiative. And in that case, it's really going to depend on, of course, the complexity and the scale of the data that you have and other resources in the environment. But Here's where strategies like using a reference architecture can be a huge advantage. But at the end of the day, you start with identity. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that does make a lot of sense. Now, you started to talk about this a little bit before, about um, questioning some vendors or anybody that's going to tell you that they can guarantee zero trust solutions. So how can somebody evaluate a vendor when they're selling a zero trust solution? Yeah, and like I said at the beginning, I think zero trust is, is probably being abused uh, as a marketing buzzword right now. So definitely have that healthy skepticism about vendors claiming to do zero trust. Um, like I said, it's not a single product or solution. So I would ask, what role does this product or solution play in a zero trust architecture? And go back to NIST 800-207, look at the components of a zero trust architecture. NIST calls them things like a policy engine, policy enforcement point, information feeds. So ask the vendor, where does your solution fit here? And what other products and platforms can I integrate? What other types of telemetry or context or environmental attributes does the product produce or use? And then ask them to demonstrate, right? How does this product actually get used practically um, in a, a system design or a reference architecture to support those zero trust principles? And I'll just say it again, just remember, there's no single product or service or solution out there that constitutes a zero trust architecture by itself. Zero trust is a security strategy or philosophy, not a product. Uh, well, I like the way you said have them um, explain it, like have a have a discussion about how does this how does this work? You know, give me an example because I, I always tell everybody that the more conversations that you can have with the business owners that probably don't understand most of the stuff that you're talking about in the first place, that if they can actually say, oh, okay, I know I can visualize myself using that application, I can see where this would this would be doing this. So I, I like that. I like that when you say to have conversations in practicality, what do we what what is this thing going to do for us? And then that might also help point out where some of the vulnerabilities still exist because they may be thinking, well, you know. Well, what about this? And so they're, they're just good conversations to have. So I'm glad, glad that you said that. So good. Well, that was a good explanation of this whole zero trust thing. So if you have anything else that you want to throw out there before we uh, sign off here? Um, I'll just say, I know it gets a little heady talking about a security philosophy, right? We're talking about abstractions. And even if you dive into the, the literature that's out there, like I mentioned, the NIST special publication, um, those are great places to start. But there are an increasing amount of resources online that talk about how to put this in into practice. Um, and that's a good place to hang out, too, before you actually buy any particular solution or reconfigure anything. Um, and I will, maybe I'll just close by saying that even though I kind of ended there on a, a word of caution about vendor solutions, there are some awesome uh, solutions that have come to market in the last few years that can help with zero trust that um, I wholeheartedly endorse. So it's not like stay away from these products, more like just be careful as you're uh, interpreting the marketing messaging. Okay, good advice, good advice. 
Well, thank you very much, Ryan, for your time and all of your great input. And thank you, everybody, for watching. We appreciate it. And hopefully we will see you around on the next one. Take care. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. This episode is brought to you by Steelroot, a national leader in helping companies meet cybersecurity compliance requirements and prepare for CMMC. Their experienced team of engineers and consultants assist organizations of all sizes to implement and manage IT systems that meet the technical requirements in DFARS and CMMC.